to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. On TV. On radio and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. You're on talk. We are on TV, we're on radio, we're online and of course we're on your smart speaker. Coming up, the Tory saviour. After seeing off last night's Rwanda vote rebellion, could Rishi Sunak save the Conservative Party from oblivion? Sir Keir Starmer says he never really believed Jeremy Corbyn would become Prime Minister in 2019, despite being at the heart of his election campaign. And Kate's shock surgery and the King's prostate hop have exposed just how reliant the royal family is to their top stars. So where's the goodwill message from Montecito? Good evening, Britain, and welcome to the brand new 2024 version of the Independent Republic of Mike Graham, right here on Talk TV. Well, it's been one hell of a week in the big, bad, dangerous world of international journalism, and we've got it all for you tonight. Serious questions for Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer, like, is he a snake? Serious questions for Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, like, is he finished? Serious questions for Harry the Herbert, like, where is he? Plus, more anti-Israel hate coming this weekend. And will the eco-zealots ever stop trying to scare us? This is the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. We're turning up the heat. Rishi Sunak's Rwanda bill may have survived its third reading in the Commons, but the Tory party has been in total turmoil in a week riven with rebellion. Dozens of MPs defied the party line to vote for amendments to the Prime Minister's big bill, including 60 for Bill Cash's amendment on dodging international law. And despite a furious whipping operation, 11 MPs still voted down the Rwanda bill last night, with 18 more abstaining. We know letters of no confidence of Rishi Sunak are trickling in. Just how many, though, is unknown. But it only takes 53, that's 15% of the party, to trigger a leadership vote. To unpack all of this, I'm joined in the studio by Talk TV's political correspondent Alicia Fitzgerald and the founder of Conservative Home, Tim Montgomery. Very good and warm welcome to you for a Thursday night. Um, welcome to the new version of the Independent Republic, Tim. Amazing um, studio, I love it. It's, it's wonderful, isn't it? Quite a week for Rishi Sunak. I mean, he ended up today kind of telling the House of Lords not to do what they're supposed to do, which is basically to have a look at the bill and see whether it's any good. Um, I don't think they're going to listen to him, to be honest, but nobody's listening to Rishi Sunak, are they? Well, no, so obviously we did see him just about see off that big rebellion mm. yesterday. All of these MPs who created so much noise the night right. before saying they will, you know, they'll vote it down, yes. they were really anti it. When it came down to it, succumbed to the pressure. They sort actually. of bottled it all, didn't they? Yeah, of course. And that happens all the time in politics. We hear so much noise before mm. something and then when it comes down to the vote, it usually does just go through. But that's not the end of the rebellion. Right. Those on the right who did abstain from the vote are still really angry mm. about it. It didn't just stop there. Right. And the Rwanda scheme is definitely not going to be happening anytime soon. It goes to the Lords. Right. He'll face loads of scrutiny there. And obviously, we heard him in that press conference earlier today telling the Lords not to stand in right. his way and to let it go through. But we'll have to see what they do when it, it sounded gets there. Vain. You know what I'm getting the sense of now, Tim, with Rishi Sunak? That it sounds as though somebody's telling him to do things in a particular way, mm. uh, as if it was almost slightly Trumpian what he said mm. today. You know, like, let's forget about all that sort of, you know, non nonsense about, you know, scrutiny and let's just do what yeah. the public wants. Well, the public doesn't really want this bill because it's not any good. Yeah. The public would like a bill that works, but they don't want this one. Rishi Sunak, I, I, sometimes I think he's a bit like a used car salesman, sometimes like a sort of casino yeah. sort of... But I basically... It's lo someone who's like, watch political drama, watch politics from the outside, and sort of trying to act the role. Yes. It's not like he's, he think this is how a politician should behave. This is how a populist politician yeah. should behave. Right. And this is what exactly I'm going to do. But it, you don't get a sense that it comes as any there from the real inside. No. There's not a there's not an irreducible core. No. There is just um, an increasingly frenetic search mm. for a new initiative this week to yeah. try and turn it around. And then if there isn't a poll transformation within three days. They say, what's the next big thing right. we're going to do? Yeah, it's like... And it's we're like, all so... watching this, and the half-life of it all is getting shorter and shorter. And as a Conservative supporter, 
I'm incredibly depressed yeah. because they have no strategy. Mm. No strategy. They have no strategy. They have no policy. It's an ADHD government, it seems to me. That's Let's right. have a look uh, at Rishi Sunak today, uh, sort of more or less trying to overcome what we now call democracy in this country. More people are likely to lose their lives by tragically drowning in the channel. That's the consequence of having no plan. That's why we have to stick to our plan. That's why the House of Lords must pass this bill. It's time to take back control of our borders and defeat the people smugglers. It's time to restore people's trust that the system is fair. We are making progress to stop the boats, but now it's past time to start the flights. Well, I think you'll be waiting a long time in the departure lounge if the uh, flight's <laughs> plan is anything like the boat's plan. Um, but Tom Hunt is here, Conservative MP for Ipswich. He joins me now. Tom, very good evening to you. Good evening. Um, there's a lot of flickering going on my screen. There is a lot of flickering going on. That, I, I don't know whether, whether we'll, we'll be allowed to keep that up, but, um, but we're, we're quite happy to keep it at the moment while we've got you yeah. on, Tom, because we wanted to talk to you about everything that's happened this week. Um, you abstained last night, um, along with quite a few other Tory MPs. Is this the beginning of a long process of you still trying to get something better than what we have? Or have you kind of accepted that something is better than nothing? Look, I mean, I, I think myself and a number of colleagues have worked in incredibly hard. I mean, it's, 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 it's easy to sort of dismiss... Um, you know, what we did by abstaining and so on, or we should have you know, voted against the people who have never been members of parliament and have never uh, been in a position that we've been in over the last week under extreme pressure. Uh, and it's, it, um, and it's, it's very easy to castigate members of parliament, uh, sometimes legitimately. Uh, but I just, I just think it's a, a little bit rich, actually, sometimes from some people to do that. But by, that's by the by. Um, but I have, you know, a big group of us worked incredibly hard to try and get this bill into the right place. We had concerns it wasn't strong enough. And having back two previous bills uh, that haven't done the job, we we were very anxious that this one really does do the job and it's as strong as it needs to be, which is why I voted for three amendments. I voted positively for three amendments, two from Robert Jenrick, one from Bill Cash, that I think if they'd been adopted, it would have put the bill in a stronger position and given it a higher chance of being successful. But once those amendments were defeated, sadly... Uh, I was in a position where I had three options. Uh, option one uh, was to vote for, for a bill, a bill that I expressed concerns about, a bill that I, I fear won't do the job, to vote against it, uh, but with no particular plan about what we do next mm. uh, and you know, no real idea about what would come next, or, or abstain, which is what I did. And a lot of people attack uh, abstentions, but all I say is I was in quite good company and a number of colleagues, such as John Hayes, who I have immense respect for, who has done a huge amount for this country in terms of fighting for you know, the sovereignty of our parliament and, and everything else. I, I felt like I was in good company doing that. Yeah. Um, but I was, pay I was in a pain position last night. Um, I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I hope the bill does work and we get flights to Rwanda at scale and we stop the boats. Um, but look, if, if it becomes clear in, you know, in, in, a, in a few months' time that the bill isn't working as intended, then the government needs to be prepared to go back to the drawing board and, and do something radical. Yeah. Now, listen, I'm, I'm not an absolutist about, about this, Tom, and I, and I totally understand why you and many of your colleagues decided to abstain. Um, but is there any part of this bill as it stands at the moment, in its current form, that you and your colleagues can claim to have had any influence over? I mean, can you at least say that as a, as a result of some conversations you had with the Prime Minister, that some things in the bill are better than they would have been? Well, I, I, I think, and I mean, clearly, I, I would have liked the government to have moved further when it came with regards to accommodation with uh, the rebels and our and the amendments. Um, so, you know, none of the amendments were adopted. There were no um, significant changes to the the bill. I think, in terms of the amendment twenty three with the generic table, which is about the section thirty nine orders uh, and being able to block ECHR uh, rulings. I mean. We didn't clearly didn't get the movement we wanted on that, but we did. We have had some um, more assurances from a minister. Letters have been exchanged, it, insisting that the government will be able to ignore these ECHR interim rulings, and is and, and the prime minister has made it very clear he'd be prepared to do so. So look, hopefully that's a, a bit of a step forward. But I mean, clearly I'm not, you know, hugely happy about things. Otherwise I would have voted for it. 
Um, but look, I've been voting against it. For me, it was a real step into the unknown. I think it could have it could have been immensely destabilizing. And actually, there are aspects of this this bill that it, I do see as being a, a step forward. And I think to kill it entirely, I just didn't feel comfortable doing that. Do you think it was a mistake, though, for the Tory party to focus so much on this particular bill in this particular week? Because, you know, there's an awful lot of problems inside of the party. There's an awful lot of problems around the country in various ways, uh, in, in, in the NHS or whether it's in uh, the striking doctors, the striking rail workers, you know, the fact that the uh, inflation rate isn't perhaps going to be what we thought it might be. You know, is this really the most important thing to fight over, in a way? Because it's the Rwanda bill which is causing all the problems, really, for the Tory party at the moment. Um, and it looks as though that's the only thing from the outside of Westminster that the Tory party cares about. Um, tackling illegal migration is of immense importance. I think particularly for 2019 Conservative voters, it is of critical importance. So I, I think the government is right to focus on tackling illegal migration. It also needs to look at net legal migration as well. Uh, and do something significant. So, I mean, some people sort of say, oh, you know, it's a mistake to talk about immigration because, you know, all we do is sort of inflate reform. Ridiculous argument. Immigration is a huge issue uh, and we need to be fully focused on it. There is a massive disconnect between where uh, the silent majority of the public are at when it comes to illegal migration and migration and the present day yeah. reality. And I think the majority of Conservative MPs, I think, get it. Not all of them. Yeah, no, listen, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not saying that immigration is not an important subject. I'm saying this particular bill is not very important. Rishi Sunak, well, we're told, three years ago, didn't even think Rwanda was a very good idea. Now he's telling everybody to stop what they're doing and make sure that it all goes through so that he can win the day, a day that he didn't think was worth even entering the, the, the fray on. I don't think it's fair to say that when Rishi was Chancellor, he, he, he attacked the Rwanda deal. He expressed concerns about some of the cost elements and as, as being Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time, well, he wasn't it, it was his job it, to raise he? those sorts of questions. So it's his job to raise those sort of questions as Chancellor. Look, he's made it clear that he supports a Rwanda scheme. Um, you know, you, you know my views about the bill. I, I rebelled four times over the last two days, but I, I do think he believes in a Rwanda scheme. Um, when I look at across the world at other countries that have attempted to tackle illegal migration in small boats, it's clear to me that you have to have a deterrent. If you don't have a deterrent, you cannot make meaningful progress on topics tackling the small boats. Rwanda is our deterrent. I think if the Rwanda scheme was allowed to work, I think if you got flights at scale, you would see a big um, impact in terms of tackling the small boat crossings. I think it would be a deterrent. Uh, and I think that one way or another, we've got to, we, we, put our, we, we put a lot into that. We've got to make it work. We still can make it work if we do what we need to do, but particularly in relation to the ECHR, which um, I, I spoke yesterday in the House of Commons about the ECHR. It, it is my strong prediction that we will end up leaving the ECHR. It will be a bit like... It, 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 there's, it, it's, it's, it reminds me of the Brexit debates, these current debates about the ECHR. One way or another, we'll, we'll end up leaving it. Um, I think it's probably a good idea if we get to that point sooner rather than later. OK. Final question for you. I hear that uh, there's some letters going into the 1922 committee. Uh, are any going in from those of you uh, who abstained and or voted against the bill last night? Well, I, I, saw, I saw something on social media about that earlier. It's news to me. Uh, I haven't spoken to any colleagues who have put a letter of no confidence in. I certainly haven't put one in. Uh, but that isn't. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not in that headspace. Okay. I'm in the headspace of, of wanting, the, wanting to wanting, wanting to tackle this issue, uh, and I will continue. Those those 60 so MPs who you know voted for these amendments yesterday, uh, we will remain engaged and we will do what we can. But we worked. You know, a, a number of people, such as you know Danny Kruger, Miriam Cates, Robert Jenrick, Swella Braveman, worked incredibly hard to try and get this bill to the right place. We, didn't, we clearly didn't get most of what we wanted, uh, but look, I, I hope the bill has a chance of success. And if, it, if it's clear that it isn't working as intended, the Prime Minister needs to take radical action right. to, to, to ensure that it does. Do you still full confidence in Rishi Sunak taking you into the next election? Um, Rishi Sunak will lead the um, uh, Conservative Party into the next general election. Uh, I think he has uh, many attributes. Um, I think he is often unfairly derided. Um, um, clearly, he is tackling, as Prime Minister, like many leaders across the, the Western world right now, he is dealing with an incredibly difficult issue that can feel intractable. Uh, and there's not many leaders who have got it entirely right. 
He's doing his best to try and find a solution. Clearly, there's some disagreements on as um, fairly significant aspects of the bill yesterday. Uh, but, you know, he's got a difficult situation, right, because he's got, you know, 60-odd MPs, who, and it's more than 60, we've probably got 100-odd MPs who feel very strongly about this issue from our perspective. But then you have some other members of Parliament of the Conservative Party who I, do, I don't really think get the gravity of this situation. My view on immigration, both illegal and legal, is it's gone from being an important issue to an existential issue, uh, and the Conservative Party need to do it. And if mainstream parties, such as the Conservative Party, don't address voters' concerns with immigration, there are warning signs about what happens all over the world, yeah. and I want to avoid that. Yeah. Tom, thanks very much indeed for talking to us. Tom Hunt there, uh, giving us his view on the vote last night and also uh, what happens next, because um, Alicia and Tim are here with me still. Um, what does happen next? Because the Lords clearly are not going to rush at, through any of this. Um, we're not going to see anybody going to Rwanda on a plane, I don't think, this side of Christmas, um, and probably before the election, are we? So... I have a sneaky feeling that what might happen is this bill will get passed to the House of Lords at some point. We don't have a set date. It yeah. will just be kind of as soon as possible. Right. And that probably means at least in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah. That will happen. The Lords potentially, if they want to table any amendments, what then happens is it gets passed back to the House of Commons. Yep. It then gets passed back to the House of Lords. And then we have what we call Parliament ping pong, which just is a really, really long process. Yeah. It can go on for a really long time. Yeah. And then we've also heard Rishi Sunak today in that press conference, he refused to say whether or not there will be a flight before the next general mm. election. Right. And that's a really big because deal, he can't, obviously. He can't really say that there will be because he, he's probably pretty sure that there won't be. Well, exactly. But that doesn't really give people much faith that no. any of this massive, you know, arguing about all of this was really worthwhile. Well, this is my point. Sure that anything's kind of what happen. I was saying to Tom Hunt, Tim. I mean, it doesn't seem to have been worthwhile. Um, it's focused only, really, people's minds on how um, disparate the, the various different parties are inside the Tory party, it's true. doesn't it? I, th I think it's also shown, underlying all of this, is the fact that the work that we've done with Brexit is really only half done. Mm. We sh aim to be a sovereign country where we could decide who came to our country, how they came, and when they come. Mm. And we, it's clear we still can't do that because a thicket of judicial and um, parliamentary uh, institutions, mm. conventions, is stopping us from doing that. I agree with what Tom Hunt has just said. Yeah. Ultimately, we need to leave the East EHR. The problem, though, at the moment is the Tory party, as you say, is divided. Mm. And whereas there are people like Tom Hunt who want that, there is a growing group, this one so-called One Nation yeah. group, well led by Damien Green, who's proven to be, you know, one of the most interesting characters in the parliamentary party. At the yeah. moment. But he resists all of this. His group resists all of this. And, and where's Sunak David Cameron in all this? Where does Cameron sit in all of these little groups? He's remained very quiet. He has been said that. Has he? <laughs> I mean, you'd have to assume he's with the Damien Green lot, wouldn't I, you? I, I'd say so. I think that's right. Yeah. yeah. I What's mean. Nadine, no, Nadine Dorries thinks he's going to be the next leader of the, um, of the Tory party. Yeah, like, Nadine, is, I love Nadine, but I don't agree <laughs> with her on everything. No, and um, it would be very difficult. I think if David Cameron was in the Commons now, yeah. I think the Tory... Well, I mean, you know, stranger things have happened. You know, it's not an impossibility if, if that's... A, you, can renounce, you can renounce, a, I think, an um, inherited period. Right. You can't renounce one that you've taken as a life peer. Well, so you can't ever get, actually get rid of it. Well, you can, you know... Parliament supposedly is sovereign, yeah. you can change the law, right. but the whole of Parliament would have to change the law to get right. David Cameron back into the Commons. That's the other bit about what Tom Hunt said about yeah. parliamentary sovereignty. I mean, parliamentary sovereignty includes the fact that there are two houses of Parliament mm -hmm. uh, which are both independent from one another mm -hmm. and which both have a job to do which is different from one another, which Rishi Sunak apparently doesn't want. Yes, I thought it was, it was an interesting So there's only some there. parliamentary sovereignty ones. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you can pick and choose, right? Yeah. Like, you right. pick and choose when you want it. That seems to be the... The thing I would most want, though, Mike, I think you're onto something and saying that immigration is the issue, not Rwanda's yes. issue. Mm -hmm. But you know what? The other issue is the economy. Yeah. Now, at the moment, Labour are getting away scot-free. Mm. They have a £28 billion environmental programme. Right. When the Tories won the 1992 general election, they put a price tag on Labour. Mm. They made it clear, OK, you don't like us anymore, but if you vote for Labour, this is how much it's going to cost. Do you remember those tax yes, bombshell pla packards that appeared all over the country? Mm. The Tories haven't begun to do the work of, of, of attacking Labour in that right. way, showing that there's an economic cost to them. Yes. And back to the point I was saying earlier, you can't just do that for three days and then move on. Mm. You need to do this as a sustained yeah. attack on Labour over many months. And they need to get on with it like yesterday. Yeah. And this whole Rwanda discussion at the moment, I'm afraid, is a diversion from one, 
focusing on all immigration, yeah. and two, that economic message. It seems bizarre to me, and we've got to stop, unfortunately, because we're out of time, but it just seems bizarre to pick a fight that you can't win. Mm. And that even if you do win, it doesn't mean anything. Well, it's kind of bizarre. It's odd, isn't it? Definitely. And I think when Amateur. Tom Hunt mentioned, oh, you know, like, this is a really important issue. It is, but it's not the only really yeah. important issue. Right. It, there's absolutely no means to say that if uh, one flight goes to Rwanda, that means that loads of voters yeah, will start won. voting for the Conservative <laughs> yeah. Party. There are right. so many other things wrong at the moment that the electorate really wants to see uh, change in. Exactly right. Thank you very much indeed, Alicia and Tim. Uh, we'll see you again very shortly. You're watching the Supreme Independent Republican, Mike Graham. Coming up after the break, Mr Flip Flop, Keir Starmer's rebranding yet again in the hopes of advancing his own electoral fortunes. This time, he's throwing his friend and Hamas groupie Jeremy Corbyn under that bus. You're in for a laugh as well after the break as we'll be covering the latest nonsense from Camp Starmer. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back. You're watching The Independent Republican, Mike Graham, right here on Talk TV. Mr Flip Flop is back at it again. The man hoping to be the next Prime Minister, Keir Starmer, has thrown former ally Jeremy Corbyn under the bus. Good place for him. In a new ITV programme released tonight, Keir Starmer, up close, insists he never thought Mr Corbyn had a chance of becoming Prime Minister in 2019, despite being at the heart of his election campaign. Let's have a look. I didn't think the Labour Party was in a position to win the last election. I didn't obviously vote for Jeremy Corbyn in 2015 or 2016. On the contrary, I resigned. But you travelled the whole. You travelled across the country to well, in, it, argue I, for him. You know, I thought that once that 2016 Brexit referendum had happened, I took the view that what then followed in the next few years was going to be felt for generations, and that 
um, I thought it was my responsibility to play a full part in that. I mean, what does he even mean by that? Nobody knows what Keir Starmer means by almost anything that he says. Uh, let's bring in my panel for this evening. Please will come to Mike Indian, broadcaster and psychotherapist Lucy Beresford and broadcaster and barrister Andrew Eborn. Welcome to all of you. Good to see um, you. Keir Starmer has a particular skill, which I've discussed with people in the past, where immediately he says something, you just forget it. You <laughs> totally... <laughs> I've watched speeches by him. I've, I've sat with people watching speeches by him and you turn to them after and you say, what did he say? And you, everybody's forgotten. They're kind of like... He, he, he sort of puts you into a trance of some kind. He has where charisma. You can't, you do, <laughs> charisma, I like that. I, I like that a lot. charisma bypass is, is what I think they said. It, <laughs> it, it really is. He doesn't have um, a sort of... Um, any, any sort of personality that you can decipher. <laughs> And I, just, which is I mean, kind of perfect if you're a barrister or if you're yeah. prosecuting. Well, actually, I disagree. Well, what's this? Oh, oh, well, oh, I don't know. Oh, actually, I, I don't disagree. Know. I think some of the most colourful characters I've known in my life have been barristers. Yes. But and you, the better you are uh, at being But when you're a, performing, yeah. you do, it's not about you. It's about the case that you're prosecuting. Yes, but I can't imagine him performing as a barrister in the same way that, say, Andrew mm. yes. or other friends You can of imagine mine me who, doing a better well, job. Maybe yes. that's why he's a former, <laughs> former barrister. I, I, I suspect he would be a really boring barrister and a really boring <laughs> lawyer. I think what's yeah. really sad, watching tonight's programme, was yet again he talked about how he was estranged from his father. Yeah. You know, and talk about... OK, you want to talk about the personal side and about his relationship, yeah. how great it is with his wife, how one of his uh, children, he won't say who, doesn't want to come to Downing Street if he gets in there, they don't want to oh, say right. where they are. Oh, really? um, so no, they've always had the conversation. Well, exactly. But he said yeah. that he was always estranged from his father. And, and you think that's a, sort of a sad moment. I don't know. Is that sort of revealing that he's trying to appeal to people who don't get on with their fathers. I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's a strange one, isn't it? Really? I don't know. I mean, I haven't had the benefit of seeing this uh, uh, programme. I've just seen that one piece. He was watching yours from, instead, from the trailer. Well, exactly <laughs> right. It's far more entertaining, to be honest. <laughs> but, you know, I just I worry that, that, that Keir Starmer, one, doesn't appear to have any ra real kind of conviction about anything. I mean, here he is talking about Jeremy Corbyn, yes. who he did call his friend, whether of he course. likes it or not. That is a it's huge on, risk. You know, to be able on... to say, I didn't actually believe in 2019 right. that we could... But you gave a really good account of that in 2019. Yeah. And he so said Jeremy Corbyn was his friend. Now? He also said there should be a second referendum yes. of the European Union. Um, he also said that, you know, uh, he would definitely stop and review all arms sales to Saudi yeah. Arabia, which last Sunday when he was on uh, BBC show with Laura Kurzberg. He said yeah. he's not going to do that anymore. So, I mean, everything changes with this guy. His conviction yeah. is to win. This is and, this is a man who's potentially leading Labour into, you know, what could be a fifth election defeat if things go very badly wrong in the yeah. opinion polls. So Starmer's conviction to win is overriding everything else. Yeah. I think there is a little bit more room for him to show substance. And not just the personal stuff tonight, but you could see on Anish Kastana's face in that clip when he was talking about Corbyn, she wasn't convinced. No, of course, look, neither was you know, I. He may not have thought that they could win, but he could have left the shadow cabinet and um, campaigned against Corbyn. And, and the trouble is this, when you tow the party line, which is clearly what he's doing, yeah. you never say about your leader, they're not going to win. It's always going to come back to bite you, isn't yeah. it? So all these little clips about saying, well, if I didn't really mean that, well, what are you meaning now? Right. Why should we believe anything well, exactly. you say It's like a guy basis. who comes up to you and goes, I used to be a liar, but I'm yes. not now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, OK, then. Hey, thank you. Bye. Also, who, On is, you go. who is the audience for this? I mean, this is primetime TV. Yes. So ITV has cleared their schedule for a programme that actually probably not very many people are going to watch. How many people really actively tune in to party political broadcasts? Yeah. This is just a half an hour version of that. Yeah. And, and it'll be interesting to see whether actually the average man in the street and the person who's like 50% less engaged than the average man yeah. in the street is not going to be watching And they're going to do one on Rishi Sunak in a couple of weeks' time for the balance, aren't they? Oh, well, are they? That, yeah. Apparently, yeah. They better yeah, move quick in case I mean, the, the problem, is called. The problem for Starmer, of course, is that when he was up against Boris Johnson, you know, he was uh, um, um, appearing to be a better bet in the sense yes. that he was meant to be a safe pair of hands, he was less flamboyant, um, you know, he was the guy that you could sort of rely on rather than this kind of crazy character who just kind of po kept popping up and talking about random things for no reason. But against Rishi Sunak, he doesn't look like that guy because they're both pretty boring. Yeah. And so he doesn't have that advantage. This election is going to suffer, I think, from the fact that unlike 2019, you haven't got the big personalities out there. So, you know, although Corbyn wasn't charismatic, he was an identifiable character. The political cartoonists call it identity tax, people yeah. that can actually have, you know, be describe them in right. cartoons. There's a reason that... And young people particularly knew who he was. Absolutely, yeah. Liked yeah. him, you know, he went to Glastonbury. We did. And you the know what Rishi yeah. Sunak should do? I think Rishi Sunak should actually do one of these programmes and literally go everywhere in a helicopter. And that yeah. should start to be his brand and he should really own it mm. in the way that Boris Johnson owned the fact that Maybe he was Maybe he could get on Michelle Moan's yacht at one point, you know, and they could just go from <laughs> one luxury <laughs> form of... Is, is, one luxury is he, is he not owning the helicopter thing? I'm not detecting you know. him rowing away no, from No, I, I, I don't think he does try to pretend he doesn't do that. What I'm really looking forward to, though, are all these deep 
fake videos, which are going to be absolutely brilliant. This is the Looking first time. To... Oh, no, absolutely. <laughs> the first time ever, I say, AI has advanced so tremendously, you can't tell the difference between what's real and what's fake anymore. And all these deep fake videos are going to be coming out. No, no, I, any I, other I would say ever. with Keir Starmer, actually, if he says something of substance, it's probably a deep fake, I fake video. <laughs> I mean, you might be old enough to remember Max Headroom. Yes, uh, of the, course, the, the, absolutely. The, uh, the first AI-generated yep. sort of talk show host. I mean, Keir Starmer reminds me of him. He does. You know. <laughs> and if, in fact, Same and I used to head. call him Max Headroom before people came up with, you know, right. clip from Captain Einstein and all the rest of it. But he is, he is a kind of, he's like a computer-generated talking head. He doesn't really <laughs> appear to have really any, even any markings on him. I mean, he's got very smooth skin. Yes. He's got sort of anybody's haircut. He wears very nondescript clothes. But listen, clothes. he's doing an Obama thing at the moment, which is if I come across as very neutral, people yeah. can project onto me whatever they want yes. to see. And therefore, I can't give the game away by actually yes. having policies or yeah. opinions. I've actually got to be really bland. I, yeah. And you're so right. It's so well, it's easy, working. It's so working. easy to be in opposition, isn't it? Because but, all you have to do is criticise. Mm. Whatever they're doing is wrong, it's not working. It's, and therefore... it's early in the political cycle. Now is the tricky part. We have to sell a vision, because otherwise, Labour... It's always harder well, for Labour to win elections because because They're working on the base. They're having conversations now, which I find extraordinary. We're going to take over, so let's start doing the handover now, as it seems to be coming out of that sort of story. And you're sort of turning around, and soon I should be saying... No, you shouldn't. Remember what happened with mm. Trump and Clinton. Yeah, yeah. You know, everybody went to bed saying that Hillary had won. They yeah. woke up in the morning and there was Donald saying... Well, that's what I happened with the Brexit referendum. Yeah, you know, absolutely. People went to Same bed. Thing. Even Nigel Farage went home. He thought yeah. he'd lost, yeah. you know. Um, a lot of people thought Jeremy Corbyn would do a lot better than he did. A lot of people also say now that the reason for Boris Johnson's massive win in uh, 2019 was because people really didn't want Jeremy Corbyn. Yes. And yeah. so now uh, we've got a situation where they say it's a bit like 97, but it's not because Tony Blair was a force of nature, whether you liked him or not, and he had some brilliant people around yes. him, whether you liked them or not, you know, like Gordon Brown, like Peter Mandelson, you know, like that whole kind of, you know, new Labour movement. Right. Um, but this new Labour movement, whatever it's called, is not a movement at all. I mean, it's I don't think most people in Britain could name two people in the Labour Party. It's 2010, really, so you've got an opposition leader who people aren't really convinced about. That was Cameron in 2010. You've got a government that's been through a prolonged period of crisis, not just COVID, but also the Brown government yeah. had deep instability that you know, people are still a bit hesitant about. Mm. The election will be a lot closer, Mike, than any of us think it will be. I agree. I think it will be. And I think some of the polls are, are, are probably going to be found to be way off yeah. because nobody really trusts Starmer. And particularly this business now where he throws his mates under the bus and says, I wasn't really his friend. The trouble that's is, I, a heard nice a, I heard a really interesting analogy a couple of days ago, which is that this general election is going to be a little bit like a bus replacement service. Yeah. You don't actually want to get on the bus, right. but because the train isn't working, you're going to have to get on That's the bus. So you don't want to go country. into... But you don't really want to vote for Labour. Yeah. Mm. But actually what's currently up for grabs in terms of Conservative policy or even the way in which they're conducting mm. themselves is so unappealing yeah. that actually people are like, OK, I'll get on the replacement Or well, maybe you just don't decide to go anywhere, just well, stay I, home. I was going to say, lots of people will stay... I think that will be down this year. Yeah. But you're absolutely yeah. right, it's a vote against as a, vote, uh, as a result and not, not a yeah. vote for, and, and that's the real problem. So the reason people like reform are really going through the roof, they're sort of turning around and saying, well, hang about, some great policies here, and a lot of people going for that sort of side. That at the end of the day, Reform are obviously not going to win the general election. Ooh, that's I mean, they could be the kingmaker. And I think you, you look at that... I think they'll be lucky to get one seat. Yeah. I don't but think that's absolutely. They have what, no policies. Or they crazy. have a brand, but they don't have any policies at all. Well, they've got some. It's not so much that. It's just the system's against yeah, but, them. But, but we'll yeah. have to come back to that, I promise you, because we are running late and I will be told off. Again, even though it's my independent republic. <laughs> You're watching the Supreme Independent <laughs> Republic of Mike Graham. Coming up after this break, thank God for the other royals stepping up in the hour of need, because family first, Harry and Meghan have remained silent on social media after the King and the Princess of Wales have been hospitalised. Not even a little get well soon message or a heart emoji. I mean, really. I'll put them straight after the break, so don't go anywhere. We're here! Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Bravman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. 
COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years. Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this is important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm I'm going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas it possible a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. This is Talk TV. With the Prince of Wales visiting the future Queen Catherine in hospital and the current Queen Camilla supporting the King, Charles, as he prepares for his prostate operation, the public face of the family now lies in the hands of Princess Anne and Prince Edward. But the main question is, where are the Sussexes in all of this? No word whatsoever. Strange. They do like the limelight, after all. Former BBC Royal Correspondent Michael Cole joins us now. Michael, very good evening to you. Welcome to the show. Um, a shocking day yesterday when those two stories sort of came out almost back to back, um, uh, that, uh, that Catherine, Princess of Wales, was in hospital and would be there for another two weeks, not to be seen probably uh, for a couple of months. Then King Charles with his enlarged prostate. Um, but let's start with our friends in uh, Montecito, Harry and Meghan. I mean, normally you'd expect them to be at least leaking somewhere about how they're trying to come back to visit and they'd love to see the king, but he's blocking the idea and doesn't want to talk to them or something. But there's very sort of stony silence from California. What's going on? Uh, good evening, Mike. You make an excellent point and I'd expect nothing other than excellent points. Uh, to adapt uh, that song we're all familiar with, from Camelot. I wonder what the prince is thinking tonight. <laughs> there he is in his own little Camelot on a California hilltop 5,000 miles away. Yes. We have to remember how popular that man was, we're seeing there. He was uh, served with distinction twice in Afghanistan. People loved him. He had a wonderful way, his mother's way with people. And then, unaccountably, he scooted off to Canada and then onto California, which may have been Meghan Markle's destination all the time. Mm. And now is the moment when he could have been doing such wonderful work and a starring role for her too, had they not decided to take that decision, which has never been really fully explained. It's the greatest sadness, and I'm sure that in his heart of hearts, maybe he, he feels that too. He says he misses this country, he misses the culture, he misses the people. He misses the traditions. Well, uh, now is the time when the country might actually miss him. Because as you say, the king is going into hospital next week. Uh, the Princess of Wales having her third night in hospital uh, with maybe 10 more of those to come. Uh, it's a moment when the royal family needs all hands on deck. And 
the king has quite rightly, in my mind, slimmed down the royal family to the direct line of succession himself, uh, Prince William, and then the three uh, children, uh, George uh, and Charlotte and Louis. Uh, but, 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 that means that the effectively 15 uh, royals that were working beforehand is now slimmed down to 10 or 11 uh, because the first Sussexes have decamped to California. And of course, uh, Prince uh, Andrew, uh, who we see in the background there, the Duke of York, he of course is no longer acceptable anywhere. And it would be very difficult for his two poss possibly very charming and cl kind and nice daughters, uh, Beatrice and Eugenie, they couldn't really do foreign jobs, uh, royal jobs, without immediately evoking the memory of their father. And that's a very great sadness. So they can't be called upon. So it's now down to uh, the Queen, who we just saw there with the King coming out of uh, St. Mary's Church at Sandringham this Christmas, and Princess Anne, uh, Prince Edward, the Duke of Edinburgh, and, and his wife Sophie to carry the can. But I think it's a great loss. And I think that... Um, in his heart of hearts, if he really thinks about it, uh, Prince Harry will regard this as a great missed opportunity when he could have rebuilt his bridges with the British people. Absolutely. Because it could have been all so different, couldn't it, Michael? You know, it didn't have to be this way. You know, they could have left, they could have taken themselves out of the sort of front line, if you like, but they could have still maintained some kind of level of contact which was not malevolent. And unfortunately, because we now know what we know after the publication of the book Spare, after we saw um, the fact that, uh, you know, when the Queen died, we now know that uh, um, Harry did not spend the following night um, with his father and his brother, that those, you know, um, relationships are more or less completely ruined, never to be repaired. We also know that the, the Princess of Wales, Catherine and Meghan, haven't spoken, I think, for years, practically. And, you know, it's all very toxic. And, and this is why it should have been done differently, because at times like this, when you have a family, you want to have people that you can rely on around you, right? Absolutely. You mentioned Spare, of course, this time last year, Mike. We, we were talking about Spare. It had only just been published. And, of course, uh, it was ghostwritten by a very clever American a journalist. Mm. I'm, I don't know whether even Prince Harry r read through the proofs, but it said some pretty horrible, unkind and cruel things about the king and the queen, Queen Camilla, uh, but notably about his, bro his brother uh, and most of all about his sister-in-law, who I think has played a pretty faultless role in her time. After all, she wasn't born into a royal role, but she's taken to it like a duck to water, a very elegant duck, I might say, perhaps a swan. And uh, she didn't deserve those cruel remarks. And there she is tonight, Catherine, Princess of Wales, in, in hospital. And let me just tell you this, Michael, uh, this is not a minor thing. This is not uh, nothing. Uh, to keep her in hospital for 14 days, well, these days, as you know, the hospitals, as soon as you're ambulatory, as long as you're on your feet, mm. you're out the door and you're convalescing at home. And that's the same even at posh people's uh, clinics like the London Clinic is, yeah. uh, where probably it's a, a pleasure to be to be waited upon. But they want them out. Mm. And here we have, you know, you're seeing what that princess has been doing ever since she assumed this role. She's been faultless. She's great with people. She looks wonderful. Uh, she is admirable in many, many, many ways. And I think I can't think of a serious mistake she's made. And of course, uh, she's been devoted to her good causes. Um, as the old Queen Mary, the great -grand grandmother of, of the King said, we are the royal family, uh, we love hospitals and we're never tired. And I think from the very, very beginning, Catherine has been uh, to hospitals. In fact, her first speaking engagement was at the East Anglian Children's Hospice, and she made a good speech there. Uh, she hasn't, uh, uh, she has, she hasn't, she did, she wasn't born to it, uh, but she's taken up the reins very well, and she's a perfect foil uh, for Prince William. But interesting to see today that he went there. He was there uh, when she had this planned procedure on Tuesday. He didn't speak to anybody when he left. I think it will be indicative that when she is making improvements, when she's getting a lot better, I expect we'll see the Prince of Wales come out on the pavement and say a few well-chosen words about his wife's condition. And we'll see over the weekend, 
perhaps uh, when they're out of school, maybe the children going there to see their mother, because I'm quite sure that they miss her, mm. and I'm sure that she misses them. I'm sure. Michael, good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Michael Cole uh, will be bringing you what the papers are saying today uh, and tomorrow morning, of course, as well. Uh, it looks as though uh, they've got lots of coverage of William going to visit uh, his wife, the Princess of Wales, of course. We'll bring you all of that a little bit later on in the show. The front page of The Sun, first of all. You're watching The Independent Republican, Mike Graham. After the break, these enviro freaks are getting on my nerves and people have really lost their way in this country. Fly tipping has become a serious scourge, costing me and you 80 million quid to clean up every single year. So stay put. After the break, we'll be speaking to a resident at the heart of the fly tipping crisis. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republican Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Now it's time for taking the mic. Here we go again. We're not even out of the first month of 2024 and the scare stories have already started. And if you thought those green nutters from the environment lobby had gone into hibernation because of the cold snap, you'd be wrong. Because now they're back. And they're more deranged than ever. Last year, we had the confirmation that net zero was nothing more than a politically expedient policy to impress the global elites and make the European Union love us again. When Rishi Sunak saw that people didn't want to pay to save the planet, he decided maybe it wasn't such a great priority to save the planet after all. As sales of electric cars plummet and financial service companies refuse to insure them, the eco-zealots are starting to panic. You can feel it. So what do they do? They start alarming everyone with scare stories about the future. Today we heard from some researchers in Italy and the Netherlands 
And guess what they had to say? Yep, you guessed it. They've got some predictions for us. They reckon rising sea levels could, there's that word again, could cost the British economy more than £100 billion by the end of the century. They're predicting floods will cause catastrophic damage to some of Europe's coastal regions and that it will all have a terrible effect on our gross domestic product. These latest doom mongers hail from a place called the Delft University of Technology. Hmm, I've never heard of it either. Uh, and they're really good at fortune telling, apparently. Or are they? How many times have we been told the world is going to be underwater? Back in the 1980s, the UN, the United Nations International Panel on Climate Change, predicted that Canary Wharf would be underwater up to the 23rd floor by the turn of the century. That's the century we're in, this century. They got that massively wrong. As did Greta Thunberg when she foretold that the Earth would be extinct by 2023, just five years earlier, she had to delete the tweet from 2018. This latest crowd says, of course, that these projections assume global carbon emissions continue on a high trajectory, which, of course, is code for saying that's why we all need to start walking and cycling everywhere. Get this. Apparently, sea levels have risen by 20 whole centimetres since the beginning of the 20th century. So that's about, I think, that much, isn't it? Uh, about 1.666 centimetres a year, which is about that much. Better get the snorkel and flippers out. Now, last week, we at Talk TV brought to you the scourge of fly tipping, specifically the absolute state of Hodes Wood in Kent. New statistics since then have revealed that there were 36,000 fly tipping call outs for councils in 2022 and 23, and that was up 30,000 on the year before. But get this fly tipping prosecutions were actually down 15%. Well, earlier on, our correspondent Nick Ellaby returned to Hodes Wood as there's been a bit of a development. Hello, Mike. Some good news to report, despite those shocking figures on fly tipping for the last 12 months. This site that we reported on for your programme last week at Hodeswood in Kent, which looks like has been had commercial waste dumped in it for the last few months, has now actually been shut down by the Environment Agency working in tandem with Kent Police Rural Task Force. They've placed some concrete blocks here at the entrance and there is now a court order preventing anyone from going inside and especially from, from dumping any rubbish. You know, there is a possible conviction for anyone doing that. And as we told you last week, we actually caught a commercial van, a lorry, full of waste. It looked like it was coming in here to actually tip it into the forest last week when he backed in. We were already here to do our report, started filming the guy because the stuff in the back of his lorry was exactly the same as is inside this woodland. You can see piles of rubbish some 15 foot high. When he saw us filming him, he then turned around and drove off. And I've been told by local people who are very angry about what's been happening that since we reported on it, they've not seen any more lorries. I've actually got a local resident to speak to us as well as a, a band of angry locals here who are very upset about the problem. Carl Ford lives locally. Carl, just, just tell us what have you seen over the last few months? What's been reported? And, and what do you think has you know, happened since we've been here? So since uh, last July, um, every other day I travel down this road to commute to work and um, I've seen large HGV lorries pulling in here. Uh, I asked a question a few uh, about September and asked them what they were doing. They actually told us they were filling in a hole with soil down the bottom, so I didn't think anything toward it. Um, local residents have told us differently and local businesses have told us completely differently. And obviously the, the state of this place now is um, absolutely appalling. Mike, this place could take months and months to clear up. We've heard there's actually a huge hole excavated with rubbish put in it, as well as those 15 foot high piles of rubbish you can see in, inside the woodland. I've also spoken to another three plot holders, people who own land adjoining this, this dump here, and they tell me they're also upset about it. They've been complaining to the Environment Agency, to the police, and also to Kent County Council. We've had real trouble getting hold of those agencies. The Environment Agency say they can't comment. There is an investigation going on at this time. You know, it's gonna take months and months to clear this ancient oak woodland and restore it to its former glory. I thought maybe, Mike, we should launch a campaign to actually get this woodland 
back to what it once was and let the deer, the nightingales, the butterflies return. Absolutely incredible, isn't it, that some part of this country could be turned into literally a dumping ground for commercial opportunities. Incredible stuff. Um, thank you very much indeed for that report. Nick Ellaby there um, at, at Hodes Wood. Joining me now is Michelle Zachary, who's a plot holder in Hodes Wood. Michelle, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate your time tonight. Um, it's hard to believe that you're looking at a part of this country that has been so badly treated and has been allowed to be used as a literal dumping ground. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much for raising the awareness on this because I actually first reported it in 2015 right. where the plot next to me had a dumped caravan, a cage which looked like it had been keeping dogs and it looked like the set of Breaking Bad. Right. And I reported that and went back about four or five months later to find the whole site had been torched and all the trees around it had been scorched. So it has been, you know, ongoing, and here we are. Nothing was done, um, and you know we're in 2024, and it's almost like the inaction has just allowed the fly tippers mm. to think, oh, what else can we do? I reported the logging, which st started in 2020, in January 2020, um, and I thought they were actually just selling wood, and I was concerned that they would get to my plot, which is very near this particular site. Right. Um, and the trees would be gone. But actually, looking at it now, I think what they were doing was preparing this for the, the actual landfill site. Yeah. And this isn't an organised, you know, this isn't just a few lads. This is an organised mm. trail. I mean, the cost of that lorry, you know, that's a lot of money that yes. we're talking. Well, they're hundreds of know. thousands of pounds, aren't they? Listen, Michelle, we haven't got a lot of time tonight, I'm afraid, but we must get mm. you back on because I want to explore this and I want to make sure that what happens next is not that these people all move somewhere else and then they start, yeah, you know, defacing you. another part of the country. But listen, thank you so much uh, for talking to us. Michelle Zachary there, a plot holder at Hodes Wood. Incredible story, and one which we're delighted to declare victory over. The Independent Republic wins the fights that it gets involved in. You're watching Mike Graham. I'm right here with the Independent Republic. After the break, I'll be taking the hate marches to task in the next hour, now that the Rando Bill has passed as well. How soon until these costly migrant hotels are finally shut down? All of that coming up. Don't go anywhere. We're here. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Bravman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. The amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this is important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? 
If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. So. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. You're with Talk. We're on TV, we're on radio, we're online and of course we're on your smart speaker as well. Coming up, migration crisis as more than 350 migrants cross the English Channel on eight boats on the same day that Rishi Sunak's Rwanda deportation bill was passed in the Commons. They're going the wrong way. Sir Keir Starmer says he never believed Jeremy Corbyn would become Prime Minister in 2019 despite being at the heart of the election campaign. And railway rip-offs, as we revealed last night, station ticket machines charging more than double compared to an online retailer, so why are we being slugged more for showing up? It's not good. Another weekend looms after the last Independent Republic show of the week tonight, and it will be much like all the others have been for the last three and a half months, albeit a slightly colder one. We will be treated to another day of action for Palestine, where thousands of people will march around demanding a ceasefire in Gaza, chanting from the river to the sea and intimidating Jewish people up and down the country. They will say it is a tiny minority of those demonstrating, but there will be the inevitable pro-Hamas slogans, the jihadist flags and the arrest for hate speech as mask-wearing thugs do the bidding of terrorists on our streets. This weekend, there are no less than 52 different demos, 10 in London alone, ranging from a mass event in Birmingham city centre to a bike ride and a solidarity stall in Hastings. Heaven help us. They will all be demanding a full ceasefire now and to stop the war on Gaza, their words. They've even taken to demanding that our government, in their words, ends its complicity in Israel's attack on Palestinians, including by adopting an immediate two-way arms embargo. What you won't hear, of course, is any talk of the hostages still being held in those ghastly tunnels hundreds of feet beneath the streets of Gaza. Today marks the 104th day they have been held since they were brutally kidnapped on that awful day in October when thousands of Hamas butchers filmed themselves killing and brutalising the dead bodies of 1,400 innocent civilians. Some of the tunnels are as deep as the Leaning Tower of Pisa is tall. Some of the hostages have been raped, drugged, tortured, sold off and even killed. Hamas released some last year and that's how we know exactly how they are being treated. Some of those released are still being treated in hospital because of their injuries. Today is also another tragic milestone and it is one for the youngest hostage being held by those terrorists. It is the first birthday of Kafir Bibas, who was taken from Kibbutz near Oz on October the 7th, that dreaded Saturday, along with his sister and his mother, Shiri. Video footage at the time showed gleeful terrorist gunmen leading Shiri away as she was clinging to her red-headed baby and four-year-old son, Ariel. No one knows for sure if he's still alive, but if he is, he would have spent a quarter of his young life in captivity, possibly alone, in the dark, horrific Hamas-built tunnels deep beneath the Gaza streets. Campaigners have been urging for the children that are still being held to be freed, and they were actually demonstrating today on behalf of the little one-year-old. But Hamas is in no mood to give Israel any concessions, and Israel simply cannot allow Hamas to dictate the terms. So I've got a message to anyone who is going to demonstrate this weekend for a free Palestine. Think about how you would feel if your mother was being held hostage by brutal killers. Think about how you would feel if you didn't know whether your baby brother was alive or not. Then tell me you have a cause to support. And if you march without calling for the release of all the hostages, you are simply being a cheerleader for murder, rape and terrorism. Later on in the show, we'll be bringing you a first look at tomorrow's front pages. But before anyone else, we've got an exclusive look at the Sun newspaper. Uh, and they've, of course, got William going to visit Kate, 
the Prince of Wales going to see the Princess of Wales, Air For You Kate. And there's a picture of him driving um, his car, which, interestingly enough, is an electric Audi. Um, we may get into that subject a little bit later on uh, in the day. But now, regardless of who's in power, the chronic conundrum of the migration saga will continue. It doesn't seem to be going away. And in the wake of all this madness around the Rwanda bill this week, it now appears that despite the government claiming to shut down 50 hotels, it seems that those in the hotels are just taxied over to other hotels. Joining me now uh, is Nigel Jacklin, who represents the No to North Eye uh, group, which is a group campaigning against housing asylum seekers uh, in Becks Hill, uh, in a f former sort of a military prison. Nigel, good to see you. Hi, Welcome back to you. the Independent Republic. Thank you. Um, it's a good week to have you in, really, because um, as we just saw there at the top of the, uh, uh, the show, um, another 350 migrants have arrived uh, on our shores, southeast yeah. of England. I'm not sure exactly where. Uh, on the very day that uh, Rishi Sunak urges the House of Lords um, to put the bill through, you know, they're meant to be going back the other way, but they're still coming this way. Yeah, yeah. but if you think about it from the arrivals' point of view, they set off from wherever they've come from a long time ago, haven't they? Yeah. So getting across the channel is just the last part of their journey. Of their journey, yes. But, but... And they've set off from perhaps Libya, um, they've gone to Lampedusa, they've arrived in mainland Italy, they've worked their way through probably Germany or France, they've got themselves yeah. to Calais or they've yes. got themselves to Normandy, and now they've got... But they've always known that's where they've wanted it's to the go, right? destination of choice. Yes. Um, and you know, look, the thing you had before, we were in Beirut in 95, yeah. and I worked with a Christian and a Muslim, and you kind of think, well, wars need to stop. Yeah. Um, that, that's just the answer. And there are a lot more de deserving people back where they've come from. Mm. Absolutely. Um, well, one of the big questions that people ask all the time is if there are wars and if there are people being killed, why is it that the men are leaving and why are they leaving the women and children behind? Yeah, yeah. So we, we should really be helping people back where they've come from to rebuild their countries. Yeah. The amount of money we spend on uh, accommodating people here would be much better spent yes. over there. Well, what you've been doing um, very, very thoroughly over the past few months is keeping an eye on the Home Office and keeping an eye on what exactly is going on in terms of where these people are going because yeah. your particular interest is Bexhill, um, yeah. which is also my particular interest as well uh, for various reasons. But there, there's a camp there uh, which is called North Eye, which was yeah. um, a British military camp, we yes. understand. Yeah. I actually went and had a look at it not that long ago to see if anything was changed and nothing seems to have changed. No. It's in a pretty dilapidated state. Most recently used by Emirates Airlines, I think it was. The UAE military UAE is a, a yeah. training ground. Yeah. Um, so, so you've uncovered some paperwork, though, that says nothing's really happening, right? Well, the, the go-ahead, the decision was announced um, in March. They were going to move people in from September. Right. And they've still not decided to do anything. Right. Um, what we've found is talking to Wethersfield and Scampton. So when Wethersfield got to 250 or 500 people, yeah. fights broke out. So the, they can't accommodate In terms of the numbers of people in the camp? Yeah, there's yeah. going to be limits. Right. So they're going to need more um, places. So they're going to need hotels again. Right. Or they're going to need more barges. Right. And the numbers won't stack up anymore. Um, and what we've also uncovered is that if you accommodate a large number of people in a building that was a hotel, mm. it's no longer a hotel. Yeah. They should apply for change of use because it's a hostel. Right. But they're not doing so probably because that still means they can get the rates. Yes. But the whole sort of deck of cards, it, it, it's just a Well, ridiculous... the whole system seems to, to, yeah. to, to cock, doesn't it? Because basically, I think you discovered that the Home Office have bought the site in Bexhill, haven't mm -hmm. they? Where they before were hoping to just use it. They've yeah. now actually just gone and bought the whole yeah. thing. So yeah. we now own it, effectively. Yeah. They paid 15 million quid yeah. for what a bunch of investors who set up a year or two before paid mm. 6 million quid right. for. Um, and the paper trail on the ownership is quite interesting. And there were different companies set up at a point in time when I, I believe uh, the, the Home Office was starting to consult about how they might do things. Right. So someone must have found out. Yes. And have they made any more kind of advancements on whether it would be a camp which was, say, a lockable camp, for example, yeah. or yeah. whether it's going to be some place that they can come and go freely. The, the MP has said that if it is used, it will be as a secure detention centre. OK. And that the Prime Minister and the then Immigration Minister have confirmed that that will be the case. Was that Jenrick? 
I and believe he was probably so. Yeah. Still in, yeah. Yeah. I, and I mean, obviously, there might be a change in government. Uh, well, I mean, some people think there will definitely be a change in government. <laughs> but that's the other problem: is that whatever happens with this Miranda bill, which has gone through Parliament today or this week rather, and is now on its way to the House of Lords, nobody really in their right mind believes that it's going to change anything. I certainly don't think it's going to change anything. Um, because Rwanda isn't really the answer, is it? The answer is to process people and if they are not eligible to stay here, to deport them. Yeah. It's really that yeah. simple. Yeah. And it's not about whether you deport them to Rwanda, you deport them to wherever they come from, surely. Yeah, and I'm, I'm doing a podcast tomorrow with a guy who used to work in returns. His job was to escort failed asylum seekers back to the country they came from. Right. And actually what Sunak... So he would physically morning, travel with them? Yeah, yeah. Right. I, it's quite a job. There would mm. be a plane chartered every week. Yeah. Um, Sunak actually said they had returned 20,000 people. I heard them say that. I don't know where that number comes from. Yeah. It's not being... The, the, the media didn't seem to be very interested well, in that. Well, do you know, the first I heard of it was James Cleverley, I think, on the day of the first vote, so when the first reading of the bill, which would have been, I guess, Tuesday, um, I saw James Cleverley making a statement. He looked as if he was in Dover or something like that. And he said, we've already sent 20,000 back. And I'm going, sorry? From, yeah. Since when? Yeah, well, it could be that a lot of them are Albanians. That could, I wondered about that um, because they're now claiming also with Albania that one of the reasons that the numbers are down is because the Albanians are no longer coming, which yeah. might be true, yes. but which tells you how many of them that were coming were in fact Albanian, who yeah. were coming here having already yeah. been deported once yes. and were coming back. And um, When I last looked, there were 1,200 Albanians in UK prisons. Yes, which is a far higher uh, number per sort of capita yeah. from any it's, other country. It's the top. There's no, with, there's no I think question. Somalia. Yeah, there's no question that an awful lot of the people who were coming from Albania on small boats were coming here to take part in organised crime. Yeah. You know, again, something that people don't say because it's not thought to be the right thing to say. But I don't know if you saw, we did it on this show, um, International Albania Day, um, back in, uh, I think it might have been back end of November of last year or December, um, where basically a load of Albanians took over the central part of London and were just driving cars round and round Westminster Square. They, 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 they ended up being kettled in Waterloo um, because there were so many of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, we do actually get all-day breakfast at an Albanian cafe round the corner from the office. So it's very good. Well, I'm sure... And the guy's I mean, listen, son has I'm not suggesting me. that every single Albanian in Britain is involved in organised yeah. crime, but an awful lot of them are. Yes. Um, yeah. But you've also got some other news um, because yes. you're telling us that you're going to be running... Um, for office yes. in the so, general election. Yes, so I plan to stand as an independent network candidate okay. in the general election in Bexhill right. battle. And who's the uh, current incumbent there? Hugh Merriman. He is also Hugh the train So we've got a Conservative. Secretary. So, I mean, if, if, the, if, the, if the sort of predictions are what they would uh, turn out to be, he's probably got a bit of a problem, hasn't he? He's got a big majority, but mm. I think I've got more of a chance of getting elected than the Tories have of... Uh... <laughs> well, you may well have. I mean, it's very possible. So you're stand are you standing on any particular issues? Is it going to be related to, to Bexhill be and the migrants? North Iron Asylum Seekers, right. um, safety and community. So we've been um, inspired, as it were, by Sussex Police. OK. Um, and also, I think we're going to go for a turning point, you know. Um, whether it will be this election or next year's county elections, I think people, they've had enough. People have had enough. I mean, I was talking earlier this week to uh, a woman who's standing in Kingston against yes. Sir Ed Davey, yeah, who's been standing as an independent Yvonne, yeah, because yeah. uh, she's going to be representing the postmasters and postmistresses. And yeah. I think people generally look now at what's been going on for yeah. the best part of probably the last 10 years. Well, Yvonne's then, already a councillor, like yeah. me, so she's known and I, I, I sincerely hope she gets elected. Yeah. I think she's got a pretty good chance of beating yes. Ed Davey because, I mean, yeah. his time is definitely up. And people are, they watch this... I mean, I don't know what your own personal view is of, the, of this Rwanda bill, but it just... It seems to me that they've created almost something out of nothing. They've tried mm -hmm. to make out that everybody wants it when everybody doesn't want it because nobody yeah. really believes in it. Yeah. Yes, people want to stop immigration, but this is not the way. I think there's this special room that they go in and they all have quite a lot to drink yeah. and they think up something really bonkers. Yeah. And um, this is what, one of them, you know. And they, well, well, the idea that they're arguing... I mean, I said the other night, it's a bit like watching The Wizard of Oz. You know, they've kind of created this fantasy, yeah. which is what we're all supposed to be arguing about. But, in fact, it's not. there's not really anything there. Once you, yeah. once you sort of delve inside, there's nothing there. Well, like you said, you, you stop wars, you sort the arrivals, 
you do processing, mm. so you don't need accommodation centres, right. but you do need to return people. So the returns bit and where people are returned to is the and bit you do that actually do. I mean, if they were, I mean, not that you would want it where where it currently is in Bexhill, but if they were going to have um, detention places, that that would be a good thing because one of the things that nobody ever says, those who say, "Oh, what we need to do is process them quicker." But what happens if they if they fail the test? What are you going to do yeah. then? Yeah, you got to put them somewhere. Yeah, so we're in favour of um, having detention centres, mm. um, providing that leads to returns, yes. deportations and if that deters arrivals. Right. So the bizarre thing is if you have one of these detention centres and it works, you won't need it. Right. Well, or at least you'd only need it for, to keep people in it for a very short yeah. time. Well, Nigel, yeah. good to see you. Thank, Thank you, you very much indeed. Uh, Nigel Jacklin there from No to North Eye. You can find him uh, on Twitter. No for North Eye is, is the uh, account. Uh, and also that is the campaign slogan as well. Now, uh, before we do anything else, here's a sneak peek for Plank of the Week. Jeremy Kyle says the NHS should not offer bum lifts. You can have a it's bum lift much. on it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have well, people you? do. People have plastic bum surgery. Lift? People can yes, have, you can have a you bum can lift. Have plastic surgery what? on the NHS as long as you can convince yeah. them that if you don't have it, you will be suffering in some way. Have you never Mentally. Yeah. Mental my, my backside's too small, I'm going to be traumatised and I won't be able to work for yeah. three years. So don't what, they, you look they, like they a Kardashian? They well, put then. filler in, don't they? Apparently so. Yeah. Yeah. To what? Into your bum. If you want a bigger one. We did a whole programme on it the other night. Yes, that will be Plank of the Week tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, of course, every Friday night, and uh, Jeremy Carl and James Whale on it as well. So, uh, one to watch for all of you. Now, let's turn our attention uh, to a story that has got me really derailed. You know how I don't like what's going on in the trains. Shocking new research has revealed that ticket machines at railway stations charge passengers more than double what they would cost online. The best value fares are either unavailable or hidden among several options on many different machines. And on top of that, figures show that just one in six of government-controlled stations actually has a full-time ticket office. Let's talk to former Transport Minister Norman Baker. He's with me now. Norman, welcome to the... Uh, Thank you, Mike. ...brand-new uh, Independent Republic of Mike Graham... Very impressive. ...club. It's almost like a club. I think I might start calling it that. Um, thanks for, for coming in. Uh, we've got lots to talk about because there's some new strikes have been announced as well. But this racket with the tickets is really something else, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's almost become like those tickets you used to find on planes where the person next to you's paid 20 quid and you've paid 300. Yes. Well, look, I mean, the principle should be that wherever you buy a ticket, whether it's online or the ticket office yeah. or a machine, it should be the best possible price for the journey you're making. Yes. That's the, the standard that should be applied. And it's not applied. Mm. It's complicated because a lot of people now are buying split tickets. Mm. And just for your viewers, if you don't know, that's where you go. You complete the journey as normal, but you, in theoretically buy a ticket from A to B and B to C rather than right. A to C in one go. Yes. And, and that comes out cheaper. Now, you can do that online because there are sites like, well, should advertise them, which advertise right. a particular product. Yes. But, of course, a ticket... Do they, do they help? Because I've heard Simon Cole has told me about this before, where he's gone, you know, if you're going from London to Bath, if you get a ticket from London to Reading and yes. then from Reading to Swindon and then from Swindon That's to Bath. Right. But, I mean, I'm, if, unless he had told me that, I wouldn't know it. Do these places tell you that? No, they don't tell you that. And you have to get a train that stops at the station so you don't get off. You have mm. to get a train that actually stops there. Right. Now, the trouble is that not every train will stop at every station. Right. And therefore, when you go online to buy split ticketing, you have to buy a particular train. Right. Not the next train. Yes. And of course... So you have to get that train. That you? train. Yeah. And at a ticket office, or yeah, a ticket office or a machine, in mm. fact, they don't know which train you're going to get. So they offer you the one which is not split ticketing, which is often more expensive. Ah. So if you're on a split ticket train, and forgive me for sounding dim here, um, do you get sort of get off the train and get back on it again? No, you just stay on it, but the train has oh, to Oh, you don't physically have to get off? No, there's no difference. Because, I, I mean, I used to travel quite a lot by train up and down to um, to Sussex. One of the reasons I gave up was because on Sundays it was so often the replacement bus oh, service. Oh, tell me about I it. I just got a car, right? But I once had something happen which was so bizarre, I didn't quite know what to do. I got down to, to the station, it was Battle Station at the time. Um, ticket office was closed, ticket machine didn't work got on the train and there was hardly anybody on it. It was a Sunday night, funnily enough. Um, and finally, the, the, the ticket collector comes around and I said, well, you know, I haven't need to buy a ticket. He said, well, I'm going to have to charge you the, the full whack, whatever it was, uh, not, the, not the cheap rate. And I said, why is that? He said, well, because you didn't come and find me. And I went, sorry? And he said, yeah. basically, if you get on a train without a ticket, it's your duty to go and find the ticket collector yes. before he finds you. Otherwise, you have to pay more. That is a principle they work on, but it's not advertised. It's very odd. And you don't know it. Right. Um, so that's another problem. Yeah. The rail replacement and busting, by the way, infuriates me because it's based on travel patterns in the 1950s. Right. Saturdays and Sundays are now really busy days on yeah. the railway. Right. And they take trains off. On Christmas Eve, we had Euston, 
King's Cross and Paddington yes. all closed. That's a disgrace. I know. Well, my daughter was going in between New, uh, Christmas and New Year, going down to Stroud from London, and had to end up hiring a car um, from Heathrow because there was no way to get out yeah. of Paddington Station. There was no way to get a train basically anywhere into the West Country. So the whole, I mean, the whole train business seems to me uh, to have just collapsed in on itself. I mean, like many things in this country, not only does it not work, but the infrastructure just seems to have disappeared. Well, the, to be fair to the railway for a moment, mm. the, re the network is the most heavily used in the world, near enough, and therefore it takes a pounding on the number of trains on it. Yes. Having said that, they have to adjust, and it's far better, frankly, with people now working from mm. home half the time, to take trains off on a Monday or a Tuesday yeah. rather than a weekend. Right. So they haven't adjusted to the new patterns post-COVID. Right. And why do you think um, it hasn't adapted to the way that we have, have sort of modernised? Because, I mean, depending on who you talk to, if you listen to, to Mick Lynch and Mick Whelan, they say it's the greedy operators who are keeping all the money for themselves and buying themselves lavish houses in, the, in Barbados and elsewhere. Mm. Um, if you listen to the, uh, the, 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 the ministers currently now, they'll say, well, we can't give them any more money because, you know, we're, we're limited up, we don't make any more money, we're still subsidising the train services. So who's, who's well, screwing it up, I suppose, is my question. There is more money going into the railways than it was because the numbers haven't quite recovered from COVID. Right. There's also a lot of fraud, frankly, which isn't being captured ah. because the train companies now get money direct from the government to run the service. Right. They don't have an interest in collecting the fare box anymore. Right. They, they're no better off or worse off if they don't collect money. Right. So that's a disgrace. So, they don't but, so we're, money. we're still subsidising them to a large extent, aren't we? Well, you could, well, we are. We are. I mean, there's a public value to the railways. It shouldn't be underestimated. If they weren't there, there'd be a major problem in the country. Yeah. So it's right to put money into the railways, but they're not running as efficiently as you should do. Right. And the problem at the moment, Mike, is that they are effectively are on neutral, yes. just on, on autopilot, because there's no decisions being taken yeah. ahead of the general election. Yeah. There's still strikes going on, as you mentioned. They've just announced new ones for February, haven't they? They have. And yeah. this, is, this, is, this is like First World War trench warfare, right. because no-one's going to get in the ground as they aren't going to give in, uh, and the government's not going to give any more money. So we just carry on, and yeah. the only people who suffer are the public. Well, I mean, we saw, for example, a Department of Transport uh, study, I think, that came out just like a couple of weeks ago, saying that I think tra transport um, travelling is down on trains pre-pandemic by about 26%. Because I think people now just find them so unreliable that they can't use them all the time. Well, it depends where you go. I mean, if you look at the East Coast Main Line, for example, uh, up to Edinburgh, mm. that's actually outperforming what it was pre-COVID. Mm. And that's partly because there's an open access operator, Lumo, with really cheap fares. Yes, so but, that's, that's, but they've struggled to find people that can operate at a profit there, haven't they? Well, they have been in the past, but right. it's now got higher numbers than it had pre-COVID. OK. Um, what's not recovered is the commuter market around London in particular, because people now don't have to go in five days a week. And that's, right. That's a, that's a difficulty. Yeah. And people well, that's now, one of my, my bugbears. They should be going in five days a well, week. Well, they, they should. But also, they're now going so-called off-peak because mm. they're now negotiating with their employers and say, we're coming at 11 o'clock. Right. And they're getting off-peak tickets. Mm. So although they're still travelling, the actual, the actual value per passenger yes. has gone down. But an awful lot of people have probably moved out of London as well, or when they would buy a season ticket maybe five years ago, they're just not buying season tickets anymore. No. Because why would you? Because they're so expensive. Well, they are very expensive, and, and you know, that's another thing that hasn't changened. Mm. You know, the idea that we have people going in bowler hats and umbrellas between, you know, a peak hour and coming yeah. back at five o'clock... Tunbridge Wells and that, all that. That's all gone. Yeah. And the railway hasn't adjusted to it. No. So how does it end, though? Because Sadiq Khan managed to find 30 million quid stuffed down the back of his sofa in City Hall <laughs> yes. uh, to call off the tube strike. Um, is that the way that Labour is going to approach this, you think? When they get in, if they get in, are they going to suddenly roll over to all of these demands from the I don't, unions. I don't think they will. I, mean, I, I, just, I, I don't think, think they will either. So I think as they're maybe banking on the fact that they will, and I mm. think they'll be mistaken because Rachel Reeves has actually been quite firm on yeah. the matter. So I think it will go on. I mean, there was quite a hard-hitting announcement from the Real Delivery Group, the operators, mm. saying this is what we're trained to be able to get this is the number of hours they work. It was quite hard-hitting. Um, and the irony is, because, of course, the rail unions want a nationalisation, yeah. the irony is the train drivers have done exceedingly well from privatisation, because mm. before it was privatised, the railway network had one employer, right. British Rail, to negotiate with. After privatisation, there were multiple employers, yeah. and none of them wanted to spend the money on training drivers, because it's expensive. So what they did was put the wages up and poach them from some other company. Right. So they've been going up and up and up the wages. Yeah, I mean, they're not paid badly, are they? I mean, there's no reason, really, for them to strike, and they've got some pretty good, what I would call still Spanish practices, where, you know, you get on a train, drive it for a bit, and then you get off the train, then you don't have to do anything else. I think that's the end of the day. Yeah, I think Ashley forgot a point that the, the, the wages haven't gone up in the last two or three mm. years. But actually, if you look at the last 10, 20 years, they've done quite well. Yeah, exactly right. Well, I mean, is there anybody selling the idea that maybe we should just do without drivers? 
you have driverless trains. Uh, well, that, that might be uh, a time for the future. Yeah. You have to get the signalling sorted out and everything else, yeah. but that's some way away. I mean, I think people would not necessarily feel very comfortable with that. And also the fact is that people actually want two people on the mm. train. They want, they want a, a guard or a conductor or yeah. someone there to make them feel safe. Mm. So I think people want two people on the train rather than one or none. Well, it depends who you talk to, I suppose. Norman, this is great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. The future is indeed bright, depending on who you talk to. And you might not be able to get from point A to point B on a train. You're watching the one and only Independent Republic of Mike Graham. After the break, I'll be joined by Thursday night's panel as we sift through the stories making headlines and all the other big news dominating tomorrow's front pages. Stay exactly where you are. We're here. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. The amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast ah, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm I'm going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Let's bring back the panel because it's Thursday night and here they all are. Political commentator Mike Indian, broadcaster and psychotherapist Lucy Berifers and broadcaster and barrister Andrew Eborn. Welcome back to all of you. Um, there's lots to talk about. Yeah. Right? There's a load going on. Um, we've been talking about um, uh, the, the big rallies that are going to be coming up this weekend, pro-Palestine rallies. We'll get into a bit of that. Uh, but let's kick off with the Royal, shall we? Because big story yesterday. Everybody was slightly taken aback by not one but two health scares for the royals. And the front page of the uh, Sun today, air for you, Kate, concerned Wills at his wife's bedside. He's gone to visit her. Uh, we were hearing before from uh, from our guest that uh, 
You might even see the kids going to the London clinic to, yes. see, to see their mother, because to be a mother and to be away from your kids, for that who long, are quite young, tough. Yeah. for a couple of weeks, it's a long time, isn't it? And it's only over the road from me, so I'm, in, I'm at Regent's Park, so I saw all the police and Did all you? the Have you taken royal... your flowers? Have I, you taken... I take my flowers, I, I, I've done my, <laughs> my royal things. And all the press, all the press pack are there right. outside. They were allowed uh, outside the Royal Academy of Music yesterday yes. for one night, for, they were saying they were in the freezing cold, I popped into my home. Um, but it's extraordinary. What I love about it is when people talk in the public, I talk about their health issues, because yeah. it's encouraging for other things. So Charles has talked about his prostate and yeah. so on and so forth. And the more they can do this, there's a lot of a big campaign I'm working on at the moment with Science with Soul about talking things about the BRCA gene which could save lives. If people just share information uh, about family history, yes. you can get people talking about it, which at the moment doesn't happen. There's no obligation yeah. to disclose that. No. So I think people in the public eye, so when Charles No, I think it's it, good that he did It's good, that. isn't it? I think so. And, and, do, equally... and, do you, and what do you make of the timing of it? Because the, it, the timing of that information mm. came out really quickly yes. after okay. Kate... Well, I was talking about this yesterday because I can't believe that it was a coincidence. I mean, clearly, they, <laughs> they, they game plan all of this stuff. Everybody yes. knows what's going on. Mm. I think, actually, perversely, they'd kind of worked out that if they released the Kate story first, yes. that people would be very concerned and would feel sorry for her, and that would take the heat slightly away from the king, because if he had just announced it on his own, they might have said, well, he's getting on a bit, you know, should he, you know, possibly be looked upon as somebody who's not going to be there for Whereas very I long? I thought the opposite. I thought that they got her story out first, yeah. and then he came in really quickly. Obviously, he's the more senior royal, yeah. and therefore, it, it, in a good way, it eclipsed I think in a way that it, 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 worked, what... it sort of worked both ways, but I think yeah. they had to do it that way round, I suppose is what I'm yeah. saying. And I think by doing that, um, they actually showed that... that it, you know, royal PR is still quite hard to do. Well, I mean, look, do, look at this you know? interest in, you know, enlarged prostate that has happened mm. since the king announced his problem. You know, yeah. and not, they're saying it's thankfully not cancer, but, you know, yeah. anything that raises awareness of yeah, mental I, health I, issues I is fantastic. People, people, people in the public eyes yeah. about that sort of thing. And also, yeah. equally, because of the fact that he was quite open about what it was, yes. people were less concerned that she wasn't. You yeah, know, and I right. think that's right, yeah. because, I, you know, I was saying yesterday that there might have been a time years gone by when, when I used to work in tabloid newspapers where the tabloids would have been speculating about what it was and mm. they might have been sort of prying, whereas now I think people are more accepting of the fact that, you know, she's got a private life, she's allowed to have medical yeah. issues of her own, which she doesn't have to tell us about, right. frankly, you know? It, it still felt very intrusive, though, didn't it? I mean, the fact that Charles had to reveal it was about process. I mean, good good for him to, for doing that, if it encourages people well, to... Well, I used to make a living checked. out of being intrusive, so I'm, you're asking the wrong right person, I'm afraid. I mean, <laughs> I didn't think it was intrusive at all. But the thing right. is, you can't not announce these things. You know, yeah, imagine if they tried to keep it secret. Well, if you think back to the, you know, the, the late Queen's final days, you know, she was seeing, you know, yes. her sort of writing something as Prime Minister, and then yeah. she passed away a couple of days later. So royal health, you know, mm. they're still experts at keeping it under. A wrap, yes. But when it's a working royal, when it's the senior rules, there's never be that strong you're, you're right. And it's just days after they had that book, which yes. talked about her final moments. And Charles, yes, so was, we off, know about that. Charles yeah. was off picking mushrooms, poor right. guy. Yes, uh, fun guy, as they used to say. Uh, but you, you work on that. On that you work that, that, that one up. Right. Up, <laughs> 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 yeah. But it, it, it felt a bit intrusive, though. I, I do think that Her Majesty's last moments mm. didn't need to be in a book. Yeah, I think actually, you know, I say this quite a lot that, that since Charles has, has been king, he's handled it all quite well because yeah. there's sort of mm. there's a modern feel to, to, to what's going on. Right. But They're I not think stuffy. Also, in an age of social media, I think it is much harder for them to keep a lid on what this information might be. So, right. for example, if you go back to the Queen, there was a photo of her meeting Liz Truss and everybody yes. noticed that there was a bruise yes. on her hand yeah. where she obviously had a sort of cannula put in yeah. that actually we were, we, were be, we were being given information yes. without being given information. Yes. And that's why I think the people who now run all of those things, the PR campaigns, because they did used to be awful at it. I mean, they, they seem to have learned quite a lot of lessons. Mm. Inside the sun, um, we've got Camilla, um, who uh, we, were, I think, learned the other day from that same book is called Lorraine. Yes. Uh, her nickname. <laughs> oh, no, well, I thought Lorraine was her magic. The other. The no, other it's the, no, no, it's, it's for one, Camilla. Was it? Camilla. Lorraine, How yeah. is his mad? She yes. was asked. And Camilla <laughs> says he's fine. Looking forward to returning to work. So, um, you know. All's well. My, my only slight, and you might you might not agree with me on this. Yes. Point. My only quibble uh, with William, and people will say that's ridiculous, is he's driving what looks like an electric Audi. <laughs> so the two black it's very <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, the fleet of electric Audis. Everybody knows that everyone who drives an Audi is now like a BMW driver. Yeah, very he's not driving drivers. that round bar moral though. No, there's no I mean, charging why, points why on bar moral. Why has he got a Land Rover? Or no, a Bentley. Exactly. Or, a Bentley. He should definitely or an Aston Martin. Be, like or a Mini soft top Mini. Soft yeah, well that's owned by the Germans flag. now. Though, isn't yes. it? Well, I mean, he could have one with the old Union Jack um, back lights on it. But there yeah. we are. Let's talk about. A couple of things that are in the news. One, North Korea. Ah. Rare footage shows teens sentenced to hard labour um, 
I don't know what this story is about. Lucy, you've been to North Korea, and I think we've got a couple of pictures of you from when you were there. So tell us what this story is about. Well, this story is about the there way in which some... Oh, uh, so there, there I am meeting some Who random guard. Is that just some so random that's soldier? The, that's at the demilitarized zone uh, on the North Korean like it. side. It like and somebody from the military there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. Uh, there is some sense in which it's all a big charade and right. everything is play acting. You only have to look at the size of his hat to see that. Don't you get followed around all the time? Don't you get followed around all the time? Assigned well, a sort of a messenger. And person. you you're assigned two messengers so that they can inform on each other. Right. So that's how bad it gets. That actually you can't even and, say. And anything. what were you doing there if you're allowed to say? Well, top I was just secret there, mission no, on holiday. On, on holiday. holiday. <laughs> on holiday. In the <laughs> commas, yeah. yes. For four very long nights. Wow. Yes. In Pyongyang or somewhere else? In Pyongyang and then down at the Demon try zone okay. and and that's it there's a one road that takes you from one place to the other yeah. and you're not allowed to and, and lots of tunnels of in between but i'm surprised you're allowed to have the photo because you're not allowed to have videos you're not allowed to have yeah. photos going on i've been to seoul which and, and i've been to the to the demon the, yes. uh, the, the, the dmz is the they call it. dmz the DMZ. Yeah. which is great but there, there's barbed wire everywhere but they're much more neurotic the american guiders at, yes. at the southern korean side are much more neurotic about photos and the fact that you can't wear branded oh, goods is that right? and, whereas there they were really keen that you should take photos of them with the soldiers, but you couldn't take photos of anything you wanted to. And this story yes. is about people, uh, teenagers who have been accessing material that has come in media uh -huh. that has come well, in like from online, sort South. Of beep, through well, VPNs exactly. and things. It's yes. uh, yeah, or people have them on um, USBs and they oh, swap yeah. them around families. Okay. And they're all the Korean programs, aren't it's, they? Things like Squid Game, yeah. things like uh, Parasite, well, Parasite, brilliant the movie, movie. Uh, it's um, K-pop bands. K-pop's a tremendous. And this popular. is what's so sweet. So we had a guy yeah. who had a fake. Chanel handbag and I kept thinking ah. how do you even know that that's a thing they know that's right. a thing because they do have information coming in Interesting. But the, the government tries to silence it and what they're doing and you is just can't do it can you and they're yeah. sending nowadays they're getting so much external material coming in from the west mm. that they they they're basically sending young teenagers to gulags. But the wow. fact it's come out, I think it was the BBC broke the story, that it's come out, they've been now sentenced to hard labour mm. as a result of watching the, these Korean programs. Smashing programs. rocks and stuff. Yeah. yeah. We should have a bit of that here, don't you think? Well, depending on yeah. what you watch. In the yeah. 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 Absolutely. I mean, chain <laughs> gangs and all that. <laughs> I think that it's a fascinating story, but it's also really about the pressures of growing up in a country like this. It's so into mm. in a world that's still connected all these new pressures coming through. And, of course, the other thing that's been in the news this week has been, you know, the signs that is Kim Jong-un pointing towards his 10-year-old daughter being his anointed successor. There's never been a female leader of North Korea yeah. since the, the revolution. Right. So this is these are going to be challenges that mm. his government and potentially her will have to deal with going to the future. These informed, yes. empowered, younger generations Absolutely. of people. Absolutely. And speaking of um, crime and punishment, the tube driver, you might remember him, the yes. one who shouted, free, free Palestine. Mm -hmm. um, he hasn't lost his job or he gets his job back. Probably that's OK with me, as long as he's apparently had to apologise to a lot of faith groups. Yes. But funnily enough, the story originated from a friend of mine who was on the train. Oh, right. Um, yeah, who uh, reported it to um, the Daily Mail, funnily yes. enough. Um, and uh, she was on the train. She happens to be Jewish. She said she felt terribly intimidated would do. when this crowd were all just shouting, free, free Palestine. Um, and you wonder whether, you know, that's the kind of feeling... I, mean, I was saying earlier in London... Coming up this weekend, there's something like 10 different demos, 10 different marches. Yeah. There's one big one, but there's loads dotted around everywhere. And today, uh, I was meeting with some with some people um, who were telling me about how it's the first birthday of the baby who's being held hostage currently in Gaza. And nobody talks about it. Yeah. You know, nobody mentions it. These people march around calling for a ceasefire, but not one of them ever says... Just please free the hostages. There's still 136 of them there. Well, there was a we support we stand with Israel march last Sunday. There was, and it was way more peaceful and yes. there was less agitation. Absolutely. So it, actually, there's less volume. Yeah. And that's part of the problem is that it goes under the radar. Sure. Whereas actually, if you make too much, make so this much noise. This is the thing. No, what I'm saying more about really is the fact that the people who are calling for a ceasefire never mentioned the hostages. Yes. As if you know, so there's, that's there's, there's, and that's not going on. And, and as always, my all credit to you for saying that because mm. you need to turn around and say as soon as you personify these horrendous. Yeah stories because we yeah. get desensitized if there's yeah. too much of it yes you need to talk about the hostages you need to talk about the release yes and what's happened is the poison the living in central london yeah we have all sorts of pockets of communities you have muslims you sure. have the, you have the israelis i went to oxford Christians. street once um to do something or other and there was a march going down oxford street right from a load of people from a country i'd never heard of right you know and i can't remember what it was now but it was somewhere in in africa um which was one of those relatively new countries and there was some kind of ethnic dispute going on 
And it was quite interesting, actually, but it yeah. was very peaceful. They were marching away, and it was quite, I was quite happy with that. But, you know, these people have got to stop. They just can't keep marching every no. single weekend. And, and, and the trouble is, the poison, the poison that you have on social media is spilled yeah. out onto the streets. Yeah. And that's the disgusting thing. But absolutely, call out about the hostages, make sure that they're still front and centre, yes. and we can work on that principle. Right. Shall we talk about uh, Carl Walker? Yes, you because love talking about I him. I do like talking about Carl <laughs> 30 Walker. million Well, I say, divorce. and I know that there will be people who will differ from me on this, but he's kind of... <laughs> he's the standard bearer for me of, of you know, proper old-fashioned footballers. Right. Absolute bastard. You know, <laughs> treats women terribly badly. Um, doesn't care that he's got children with two or three yes. women or four women or five women. Doesn't care what he's... Uh, you know, people who are a bit more po-faced say, oh, but he's doing horrible things, you know, he's exposed himself, he's a horrible misogynist, blah, blah, blah. I mean, he's a footballer. You know, I, I, to me, Goes he's just doing what, what footballers do. Right. As opposed to taking the knee and, you know, standing up for, you know, the NHS and doing yeah. all that rubbish that Jordan Henderson did before he went and took all the money from Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Mm. You know, this guy's a proper footballer. He's a rock and roll footballer, yeah. isn't he? That, that's I what mean, do. if he Bad was a rock boys, star, you wouldn't give him a hard time. There you, you? go. Well, and it's, it's a, almost compulsory. It's almost Lucy's it's looking about the DNA. <laughs> don't understand about it is the fact that it's stirring up so much controversy because there was some amazing research that came out recently from Ashley Madison, the married dating oh, website yeah. people, and they said that a very large proportion of people who have affairs have no intention of uh, splitting up their primary no. relationship. And my, I get the impression with him that he's very keen to keep both families going. It's and in fact, there's it, also, <laughs> but there's also a rumor but he was that, yeah. they had the same, going... that he and his wife have the same publicist and that this is all about actually creating a platform for us. Kardashian style reality. But, really? which would be but, but Annie Kilton, that's her name, is, she's pregnant as well with, with his child. Yeah, another and you one. Think of that, another one. So, yeah, exactly. And he's doing that, and he's got the couple, as you, as you mentioned, he's, he's, uh, children with all sorts of women yeah. out there. And, and it is extraordinary. But they're talking about it being the most expensive divorce. 30 million doesn't sound yeah. that much. Well, in real the thing terms. is, I think it's expensive for him because he doesn't get a prenuptial agreement. So right. She's going to get an awful lot of it. And yes. he's going to end up not, not... I mean, it's not Jeff Bezos getting rid of his wife. No, well, giving, exactly. Giving exactly. away billions. But yeah. still, I mean, the thing about the story is I think people just genuinely are fascinated by... They love it. ..these people because they're, you know, they're ridiculously rich. They don't appear to be worth it. Yes. You know, they're probably not particularly interesting or, or fascinating people to sit down and talk to on a, on so a regular So if there was basis. a reality TV show uh, after him, then you don't think anyone would watch it? Well, no, they oh, would that, no, they absolutely watch it. Would watch no, it. People would love it, but no. I think that's what they're fascinated by. because they be cool, kind of look at reality these people show, and go, anyway. can't quite amazing. believe you really like that. <laughs> we, we, Surely we, you're we, acting. Absolutely. You know. We could broker the deal here tonight. I reckon by before the programme's ended, we would have sorted yeah. that 30 I, million Well, I'm calling it now. There isn't going to be a divorce. And there is really? going to be a reality. I think it's going to be the usual. Are you pitching to the legal business? Oh, no, I'll, I'll do it. I'll break <laughs> the deal. We'll make it make sense. You're both. I'm, I'm out of this. I'll, I'll, I'll keep it out of it. Well, we'll see. We'll, 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 yeah, we'll have well, when they get divorced, I'll have you back in here. We'll, we'll do that. I'll let's, make let's, you drink three you know, glasses of uh, what we have there, which I'm not allowed to say. Uh, you're watching the incredible Independent Republic of Mike Graham. It's time for one final break. But up next, get ready for a first look at tomorrow's front pages. Plus, strap yourselves in, because the final flight of the week is going to the world of work. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. 
If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideologies? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They've that been... is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham on Talk TV. Now, it's time for this. There can be few things in our increasingly mad world that provide such instant gratification as learning that some woke enterprise or other has fallen by the wayside or has disappeared up its own inevitably PC backside. If you, like me, enjoy such events, then you're in luck, ladies and gentlemen, because I have great news for you. Our universities are going broke. And there's a very good reason. According to the Financial Times, there's been a sharp fall in the number of foreign students paying to come and get educated in our hallowed halls. Despite the massive increase in people claiming that they're coming here to study, it appears all is not what it seems. And because our seats of learning have become so reliant on overseas student fees to feed their increasingly expensive businesses, many are going to be in severe financial peril. Well, good. For far too long, ever since the explosion in higher education, thanks to Tony Blair, lecturers and chancellors have become more and more woke, more and more left-wing, and more and more wealthy. The end result, though, is that our public sector is filled with graduates of these academies of wokeism, and they're running the country and ruining it. From banking to the civil service, we're all suffering at the hands of these over-educated twants. That's twants. After three years of indoctrination, intolerance, an echo chamber left-wing dogma, our teenagers are emerging with useless degrees, chippy attitudes, and at least 45,000 quid's worth of debt. And as a result, we've got hundreds of Tarquins and Philomenas gluing themselves to the M25 in order to save the planet, instead of actually making some kind of contribution to our society. We don't have enough plumbers, or lorry drivers, or doctors, or engineers. But we've got plenty of sociologists, diversity coordinators, and lawyers. Do you see what's wrong with this picture? So here's an idea. Let's get back to educating people in common sense, training them to have a skill which will actually be a benefit to everyone else, and let's give up on this notion that half the population needs to go to university. It should never have been about making money. If half of our universities go under, so much the better. Go woke, go broke. Apologies, uh, with apologies to our resident lawyer, yeah, uh, Andrew. Yeah. Well, there are too many lawyers. I mean, I've lived in America when there were too many lawyers yes. there, and now there's too many lawyers here. You can't that, move the lawyers. There are too many bad lawyers. <laughs> what you need are good lawyers. You no, what you need lawyers, is okay. the ability to operate in a normal world without having to call a lawyer every time you need to do anything. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Make sure they enhance, they are the glue for society, exactly. and also the, the oil. Now, I've got some stories for you. Um, front page of the Daily Telegraph, I've yes. some bad news. NATO warns of a war with Russia in the next 20 years. Sounds a bit uh, drastic, doesn't it? Public told to prepare for life-changing conflict as Putin triples military spending. I mean, this is the context that the, the, the NATO alliance is about to stage its biggest ever military exercises in, since its inception, since the end yeah. of the Cold War. The other worry at the back of every NATO member's mind is going to be that if Trump, of course, there he is pictured on the front page, uh, returns to the White House, is the American component of the alliance still viable in his eyes? Because although um, national spending among NATO members on defence has risen, 
we're still very much dependent on American military yeah. hardware to underpin it. And Trump was very keen to say to everybody else in NATO, wasn't he, that they yeah. should pay a bit more. And he, won, and he so did get a concession, though. Yeah. It, was, it was a key thing. We all rolled our eyes at the time, but actually the kind of more pugnacious America first diplomacy did yield results. But it, with nations like Sweden joining NATO now, if America, Finland as well. Finland, if they step, if America steps back, then it's going to leave the European side of the alliance mm. incredibly vulnerable, but, especially with the ongoing. Well, that's why the Swedish Ukraine. government has actually announced to its citizens, you know, we really do have to prepare, and they've seen an increase in the number of people who've been volunteering for the yeah. civil guard. Yes. So Interestingly, I think Putin has more respect for Trump than he does for Biden, and I think well, on I that mean, sort of basis, it's, it's it's not just hyperbole to say that the world seemed to be a safer place when Trump was president. Yeah. Yes, I mean, the it only may person be... to actually see Kim Jong Un yeah. was yes. Donald Trump. And, and Putin. Yeah, absolutely. And, they, they, they work on that sort of basis. Yeah. And I think he's right. And yeah. I think you work I mean, on I'm that mean, I was looking at, um, you know, what's going on in the Middle East now. I mean, the numbers... I mean, we've had Iran bombing yes. Pakistan. We've got Iran sending, you know, um, uh, missiles into, yeah, into Syria. We've got Lebanon sending missiles into Syria. We've got Israel sending missiles into Lebanon. I mean, it's like this entire cauldron of, of, of crazy military activity which can't continue in the way it's going yeah. without either getting much, much worse or just stopping. Yeah, you, know? you, you absolutely have to sort of shine a spotlight on the real issues and, yeah. and make sure that we don't inflame the situation because the, the rhetoric of war, which is coming but, out... But, you know, the problem with the directions. Iranians is that they don't recognise Israel as a country. Yeah. They just don't... Mm. You won't even talk about it. You know, for them, that's off... But the off idea the... that you would then throw some rockets into Islamabad... Uh, with Pakistan being a nuclear country, yeah. uh, being a, a Muslim country, yeah. when you're actually trying to say, oh, we support the Palestinian cause, yeah, yeah. it's completely nonsensical. I know, it's absolute bonkers. Um, let's take it down a peg. Um, front page, or oh, sorry, page three of The Sun. Yes. For Brew the Bell Tolls. Apparently tea <laughs> has sunk to a shock defeat uh, in the cup, beaten by coffee as our favourite hot drink. I mean... I thought this had happened a long time ago, yes. to be honest, because mm -hmm. of all these dreadful coffee shops that you can't walk down a high street without falling into. Um, so apparently a poll of 2,000 Brits revealed a latte is only fractionally less popular than tea and has overtaken tea in Wales. Now, who knew that in Wales they would drink a latte? <laughs> <laughs> while driving at 20 miles an hour. <laughs> Presumably you could well, drink... Well, you don't speed limit. Limit. Oh, oh, on, your, on your safety, safety, safety consumption of hot drinks. Glasgow is the UK's flat white capital. Yeah, no, I, I believe that. Ordinary. That is amazing. Poll? I can believe that. Listen, I've lived in Glasgow and I didn't drink any flat white coffee when I was yeah. there. Is this poll, by any chance, from a coffee company? Oh, I, well, you, you would think so. Well, let's Three see. in five people prefer coffee, is what they claim, while well, well, only one in five choose a cuppa. But there's so many glorious teas we should have. I'd like a last It's actually it's from open Reach, it's a, it's yeah, a telecom, telecom company. Yeah. So, oh, is it? I don't think they've got any, any, any sort of um, dogs in the, in the fight, as it were. Times have definitely changed, they say. Instant coffee has fallen out of favour altogether. I must say, you always used to have, well, I did anyway, you used to have instant coffee in the cupboard in sort of in case of emergency. I, and that helped with those iconic and adverts I, I they used don't to drink have, didn't it? it? Don't, you don't I, drink instant coffee? No, not no. anymore, no. I but mean, it's all those I, capsules now, which are interesting, isn't it? Well, like, no, you need to have one of those awful machines for <laughs> that, don't you? Which is inevitably going to go wrong. Yes. You know, all of these gadgets that you have... You've got in one the in your green room upstairs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but it works. I mean, so, you know, what, what do you have at home then, Mike? Because we have a plunger. I've got a cafetiere, Yeah, yeah. That's a cafetiere. But I don't drink well, a lot of coffee at home. Is that a euphemism as well? No one here grinds their own coffee beans, then? No. No one's that I No. We grind our coffee beans, and it's... Listen, you wear a flat cap. You wear a flat cap, and you look like you might even hack me. Yeah, of course you I grind. In, I live in Walthamstow. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, of course East, you grind your own London. coffee. Yeah, All property is fair. The economy is, hinges is it, on these coffee it, shops. Is it fair trade coffee that you grind? I've oh, no, no idea. Does, <laughs> I bet no it is. Idea. I bet it is. Um, right, let's move on. Uh, there's another one here. Don't defy the will of the people. Now, this looks a bit familiar to me. The Daily Mail We're back here again. Yeah. Remember when they did the Enemies of the People front page, mm -hmm. which was all about the judges who were trying to stop Brexit happening. Right. So they've obviously tried to resurrect that. But actually, what I do like is the headline on Jan Moyer's column. The Sussexes are like two limpets sucking nutrients out of the rusty hull of the royal yacht. <laughs> are we getting a new royal yacht? Do we have one? one? Well, I mean, no. I don't know. <laughs> no. But, um, I, I don't care. I just like that headline. It's, yeah. a, lovely, it's a lovely headline, but somebody should speak up for the Sussexes every now and again. Well, I think. good luck with that. I, well, I, I do. What have you got I, to I, say for yourself? Like to say well, I would like to say, I always say this, we should look at some of the good things that Harry does in terms of things like the Invictus Games. It's brilliant, isn't yes, it? Yes, yeah. That, okay. that, that, it? I don't, I've good. never watched it. Oh, you, sh you should watch it, because actually, I think... It's, and when you hear him speak mm. at the Invictus Games, which is what he did, the open ceremony, he was brilliant. Was what he? he's done... And so all credit to him. I'm probably a lone wolf for ever speaking up for Harry, but I would do that. I 
I'd also talk about what he has done on mental health. I know people have got strong views on it, but I do think that anybody who can speak up, so we're the generation that talks about mental health, so the next generation doesn't suffer yeah, the stigma. Yeah, but he just talks has a lot of good. rubbish, though. I mean, most of what he talks about turns out not to be true. So, you know, he says he's suffering. Um, or maybe you should stop talking quite so much. And if, normally people would say, if you're suffering from mental health issues, go and see a therapist. I mean, we're talking to a professional here. There is a certain uh, anxiety that I have about the fact that you then have that platform yeah. of, a, not of a book yeah. in which you then spill the beans. The exactly. whole point about therapy is that it's very contained, yes. very safe, and you're not emotionally And it's not about getting publicity about anything, is it? It's not about going, mm. look at me, I'm really damaged. Come over here and interview me. You know, I don't think that's really good for anybody. But is it inspirational for people in the public I, I don't think about so. It. You don't think so? No. Lucy? You'll never I think, I think it's exceptionally uh, important, but it wasn't just him, because there were three yes. of them that did that. It was him, Wills and Kate. Yes. And as a trio, they worked beautifully yes. together. And, and it is a great shame that that can't happen It is. Longer. And we all know why it can't happen. Uh, it's because of Harry and Meghan. So there you are. Um, Primarctic. Great headline. <laughs> so, um, page, page nine of the sun. Apparently, staff threatened to walk out of a huge shop because it had no heating. Yes. Temperatures fell to one degree. I mean, that is cold, isn't it? That is freezing, mm. isn't it? I mean, it is very cold. I mean, I used to... When, 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 back in the days when we used to have a little tent, we used yes. to call it the Tent of Shame, we used to go down to College Green when, you know, we were in the middle of Brexit turmoil, yes. and we would sit there, and Colonel Bob Stewart, who was an MP, came in once, and he said, um, when he was in the army, if that had been the temperature, it, they wouldn't have operated. No. Because it was so cold. Well, it's, it's below we the legal there, minimum. we had this little fan heater, and he used to wear this ridiculous sort of parka to keep me warm. Well, good for them. They know, their, a... they know their rights. So no, it's 15 exactly. degrees yeah, minimum a... temperature in a workplace. I what had a Saturday job. Degrees, is it? I had a Saturday job in Marks and Spencer yeah. in the food department. Yes. There was a walk-in freezer Ooh. where you had to go in, and you could get locked in there so easily. Yeah. So people in the end refused to go in. Wow. Just well, in case they get locked in. And the other extreme is in Qatar, if it goes above 50, I think it is, you're not allowed to work outside. So what they do, they apparently they stop some of the thermometers going above 50 so people have a look at that sort of stuff, apparently. Well, that wouldn't surprise me. Those ruthless uh, building contractors, right? Now, one story which I'm going to take credit for, because we did this, I think, two nights ago. Mm. Uh, the NHS in Scotland, um, I don't know if they've now done it in England, but the Metro's gone with this on the front page, has issued new advice to people walking as icy weather grips Britain, <laughs> waddle like a penguin. That's Unbelievable, great advice. right? There was actually it's stupid. They actually put out a video. There were right. people in Scotland walking like penguins, yes. you know, like that. <laughs> and because apparently this is going to stop you. It's the perfect way of keeping your balance. Well, I think they'd be better off gritting the bleeding pavement. I, I think you're right. And then people wouldn't be sliding around on the ice in the first place. Are we? Are you going to do a demonstration? Of I'm it? not are going we? to. Oh. I mean, people have done <laughs> That's that. Great. Yeah. Um, I don't think we've got. I don't think we've got time. Unfortunately, <laughs> you know, we didn't build it into the oh, show. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, this is the thing. Ice the floor. Well, I would so waddle, used... but if I had, if I had flippers or wings or whatever they're called, I don't know. Uh, maybe that would work. That would kind of counterbalance me. But if I just waddle, I'm going to yeah. fall over. Yeah. Well, I think I used to think if you do this, right? If you yeah. stand yeah. like that and there you just go. walk like that, people yes. think there's something wrong with you. Or, you know, they, they would walk the other side of the road. I think you are right. <laughs> or you haven't been to the toilet, but <laughs> no. not but, but, but in the up toilet. A Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, just horrendous. That's anyway, just that's all from me good. tonight. Uh, you've been watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Um, thank you to all of my guests, uh, Lucy Beresford, uh, the man who now has been brave enough to come on my show and defend Harry, um, and of course, Mike Indian as well. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to continue walking like a penguin. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow night with Plank of the Week, 7 pm. Only on Talk TV, back with the Independent Republic on Monday. See you then. We're here. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Bravman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy.
for the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. <laughs>